Sunday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern here on BeyondRingside.com. Join us for the Midnight Black Mass. Myself, the Reverend Dan Wilson, brings you the dark gospel of professional wrestling, uncensored, unedited, uncut, and not for the faint of heart. You can find out more about us at youtube.com slash pottyhumor or subscribe at Potty Humor on iTunes and Stitcher today. Forget all you know about podcasts. We welcome you to an experience uniquely different. Please join us for our coverage of all entertainment on the fringe. The candles are lit. The lights are down low. It is now time for our host. As he steps up to the pulpit, the sacrifice has been prepared for the midnight black. Ghastly greetings, groovy ghoulies, and welcome to another live and in color edition of the Midnight Black Mass. As I sit here and stare at this full moon from the back porch of the compound in the hills of Tennessee, I am your host, the Reverend Dan Wilson, the maniacal minister of the occult, the devil you know. And conspicuous by his absence this week is our co-host, the Southeastern Strangler, Andrew Alexander. Apparently he is out doing a field assignment for a future edition of Fuck or Fail, but he will be back next week, fans. Don't you worry. But at this time, I do have a special guest co-host, is our producer on the show here, the man who's joined us uh, bits and pieces over the last couple of episodes, but now he's on here for the whole shebang. Fast Eddie Lane, the founder of Beyond Ringside. How you doing, man? Wonderfully well. It has been an exceptional weekend. I have enjoyed just about every moment of it. I remembered why I love living life on the road. How's it been going with you, my brother? It's been fantastic. I didn't do anything this weekend. I'm taking it kind of easy until July. Um, I mean, I've got some dates coming up before then, but my summer schedule is going to be super hectic from July to like September, so... You know, I have to try to balance that with the other responsibilities that I have. So just been kind of chilling with my family, hanging out with my kid. We just, of course, the, on the last episode, talked about our, our big summer vacation. And this weekend was just kind of a uh, get caught up around the house and spend some quality time. So I didn't do anything but just chill. I think I watch a couple of movies. Uh, I saw The Witch, which I had been dying to get my hot little hands on. Uh, it was at the critically acclaimed horror film uh very unique presentation i really loved the way they did it it's uh, set in colonial times uh actually even probably pre-colonial it's more like pilgrim times you know uh it, it was described as a new england fairy tale and folklore uh in in the preceding the introduction of the the movie and it's basically uh it takes elements of the salem witch trials and uh, even the great Tennessee legend from where I'm from, the Bell Witch from up around the Nashville area in the quiet, creepy suburb of Adams, Tennessee. Uh, but it was its own unique thing. It just took elements from all of those stories and kind of crafted its own mythology. And um, boy, it, it was really, uh, it reminded me of a Hammer horror film in some ways and that it was just like such a period piece. But it also, like, they didn't go for the stupid jump scares. It was just legitimately creepy and unnerving. And I now have to own a pet goat named Black Phillip. That's now a, <laughs> a, a mission in my life. Okay. You got me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to give a little more description, Black Phillip was Satan, actually, in, <laughs> incarnate. And, uh, was talking to the the younger siblings of the family all the while, of course, the older sister who was really the the pure one was being accused of being the witch, or really these two little fuckers who were talking to this goat <laughs> and and they were the ones behind it all, of course, in the end of course they, they, the 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 pure girl who was doubted the whole time is as positioned to be the big baby face at the end. 
and she is because she actually says fuck it and becomes a witch anyway. Oh, there you go. So, spoiler alert, but um, <laughs> it's a great fucking movie. Watch it uh, if you love horror. If you don't, then maybe you should check it out and broaden your horizons, but I really dug it. See, that's the fun part about it for me. I There are times when I can really wrap my head around a well-written horror slash psychological thriller slash slash slasher <laughs> um gore for the sake of gore has never really gotten my attention but by the same uh, but by the same token i'm also the same person who went head over heels for the faces of death series back in the day when i was a teenager but when it comes down to it a well-written can get my attention and keep my attention and i can just like get drawn so into it fucking faces of death that's a blast from the past holy shit um, <laughs> I remember, you know, in high school, we would like fucking go at the, the, they would do like a midnight showing only of faces of death around here because you know, it started to become more like bohemian and, and like artsy fartsy and shit over the last few years. But right. like when I was in high school, very conservative area. So faces of death was a little too controversial for any sort of daytime showing. So you had to get out there and go see it at midnight. And of course, the rumors were that it was real. Faces of Death was real. Everybody, you got to see it because it's real people getting going. Later, you find out that that's not really the case. And some of it you can kind of fucking tell. But others, like, you don't know. And I, I even saw an article on uh, Mashable, I think. It was one of those viral sites uh, that had talked about, you know, the, the, after all these years, the creators of Faces of Death have finally, like, outed the secrets. And I won't give those away, but if you just do a quick Google search, you can find that article right. and enlighten yourself. Right. The one that really got me, was, I mean, of course, you remember the, I think it was FOD3 that had the autopsy that also had the uh, police raid on a drug house where the person comes running out and um, they just like cap him like 22 times before the guy <laughs> finally goes down and I'm sitting back going, either that's some really good stuff. Or they shooting low caliber bullets. Was it the one where it's like a PCP enraged madman? Yeah. Man? Can't be put down. Yes, I'm going to remember every bit of that. <laughs> or the other one that actually got my attention is like I could watch it like every other time. Because the every even if I watch it the first time, I can see it all the way through. The second time, it's like. Yeah, the the autonomic sensation in the brain is telling me to yank my head around and shut my eyes. The one where the the parachute doesn't open. <laughs> Remember that one, the skydiver that you and the, they were sit. Um, they did the slow motion study of the skydiver as he's falling, noticing the the chute won't open, and he continues to pull the cord all the way till splat, and. <laughs> <laughs> so I do remember that one, yes. Yeah, because... Uh, and, uh, go ahead. No, I just said the eating of the monkey brains and oh, yeah. the, the chick committing suicide, jumping off the building, and yeah, all that great stuff. Well, the fun- <laughs> I love that shit. Look, the funny part about the monkey brains was in, uh, if you watch the Food Channel or Discovery or Travel Channel, Andrew Zimmern and Anthony Bourdain used to eat stuff worse, still eat stuff worse than that. <laughs> and it's considered a delicacy. The world has changed a lot since Faces of Death. I don't know what you can do to shock people now because the, the real thing is so readily available. You can watch a motherfucker getting beheaded, like, for real, yeah. anytime you want. Just watch the news. <laughs> okay. mm. and I mean, it, it's it's a different world, but yeah. The, Love some horror movies. We haven't talked about it much in the way of horror on the show in a while, but, um, you know, just because I haven't, like, I, A, I don't have a lot of time to sit down. You know, I I have so much time for entertainment, and because there haven't been as many great horror movies in the last few years, right. they kind of fall into the bottom of my priority list of entertainment. But, boy, when I get a hold of a good one, it is, uh, it's a religious experience. And so The Witch was that, so I highly recommend that. Um Kind of shifting gears a little bit, I heard a, a somewhat disturbing piece of news today. Just wanted to send condolences to the friends and family of Nick Menza, the former Megadeth drummer. Wow. Um, like, he was the drummer for Megadeth in my prime listening years of the band, which would have been Rust in Peace, which was how I first discovered them. 
you know, like when it came out in 90 and then uh, kind of took Stinkshire and then Euthanasia. Like those are the Megadeth albums that came out during my uh, preteen and then later teenage years. And Menzo was the drummer on all of those. So, um, you know, I it was just a hell of a, a player. And they, apparently you guys started out as a guitar tech for Dave Mustaine and, and was or drum tech rather for Dave Mustaine. He was just so good that he jumped right in and he died with his boots on as many in the profession like to say he passed away on stage during a gig with his solo band due to a heart attack so uh sorry to hear that a big loss of the music industry that keeps taking a lot of hits in 2016 oh yeah this has been one of those years where you actually sit back and go you're afraid to ask who's next because it's gonna happen I mean that's the only way I can yeah. that's the only way I can legitimately look at it. Um, I with everything that's happened, of course, the big blockbuster of the year. And now we're still finding out more details. And um, God, they should just go ahead and take Prince's relatives and make a reality show out of them. <laughs> Who will reign over the purple? <laughs> um, let's see. I think another title that I thought about was "Too Bad You Can't Take Me With You." Second out, second song off the, on the Purple Rain disc, because the rest of the family is just simply partying like it's nineteen ninety nine. Although it is twenty sixteen, and that dollar is not quite as much as it used to be. <laughs> no, and it'll be gone before they know it. But um, yeah, I, I heard that something like like two hundred plus people had stepped forth to try to claim a piece of Prince's estate. <laughs> I have a loaded question for you. You've heard about the vault, right? Yes. Okay. Right off the top of your head. Now, knowing the style of music that Prince puts out, everything that he's done over the years, whether it be all the way to controversy to 1999, you know, and there, I'm going to leave out a ton of albums, but knowing the fact that he has the vault, who do you wish? Who's number one on your wish list? to buy his vault, to try to get a hold of those songs to see if they can do something with them. <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm gonna go with the safe bet because they're curating all the other great things from my childhood and doing a fine job of it. I think Disney should buy it because they own everything anyway. And they're, uh, they brought Star Wars back to life. And they're doing good with Marvel. And I know they don't have a goddamn thing to do with music, but why the fuck not? Yeah, and consider Warner Brothers still, I think, has the rights to a lot of the stuff that he had because it was written under their watch, even though they don't, I'm sure he licensed it under his own personal rather than under the Warner, Warner Brothers logo, a may, uh, or name, title, whatever you want to call it. You're going to laugh when I say this, and there are going to be so many people who hate me for saying this. I think the person who ought to make the biggest challenge for it, here it goes, wait for it, kids. It's about to happen. Justin Timberlake. Does he, like, own a bunch of rights? Because, like, I know that was a thing for a while. Like, Michael Jackson bought up the entire Beatles catalog and so on and so forth. So is that, is that like, a thing, or is that just your wishful thinking? I'm thinking that, okay, if you notice what he did with his first three, including the last one, the double-disc set called the 2020 Experience, he has songs that are still being released in this year, off the 2020 experience three years ago and then lo and behold he and chris stapleton lit it up at the cmas earlier this year he has now taken over the world with this new pop hit um can't stop the feeling and noticing i've listened to the kids music i'm a dj i have to listen to the albums i then and i'll figure out what i like from there and play it as needed or barf incessantly um but there are some songs that Timberlake has come out with over the years that do have a decided Prince feel to them. And I'm not being, I'm not degrading the, the thought of Prince. I'm actually sitting back and saying Timberlake made sense. And of course there was rumor that there were a couple of crossovers that Prince did quietly with Timberlake and considering Timberlake is turning out to be the new King of pop. I, well, you see, um, and when when somebody dies, typically, um, what we we find is that um, they usually leave a lot of unfinished music, yep, like Johnny Cash did and Waylon did and a bunch of other people did, and so eventually that's going to get released or redone, you know, or completed by someone close to them. And often, um, if you're a big fan of the artist, like it's cool because you get a little extra track, but 
it's clearly not their best stuff because it's stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor. Right. But with Prince, that dude recorded so much shit. Oh, yeah. That uh, he might have like a super hit laying around there because, you know, he was just recording on a level that even a guy like Johnny Cash, who was recording all the time, wasn't doing, you know. Well, let me give you this one also, because if you go back and look at all the stuff that's been, um, all the re-releases that have taken place from Prince over the last couple of weeks, um, especially a lot of the pure Warner material has been re-released. However, some of the symbol material has not. And also one of my personal favorite albums, other than 1999, Controversy and Purple Rain, duh, um, The Gold Experience. It's fallen through the cracks, and I'm still waiting to see if it gets reissued because it hit special order status on a lot of places or, you know, non-existent order status. And I looked on Amazon, and somebody was selling a copy of it before Prince died for over $200 because it was considered to be a collector's item now. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, Like I say, you know, you never know what that Prince vault what's going to pop out of there. I heard there was a... uh, like a documentary on Coco Beware that he was working on. <laughs> and like, like just like there was, there's a few random wrestling connections that kind of blew my mind. So uh, fans that want to hear more about that, look, look into the details of Prince's vault. I think it'll kind of shock you. Uh, while we're on a music tip, I do have uh, at least one concert festival that I'm attending this summer. I usually try to knock out a bunch. I've missed so many with my recent schedule. Just, uh, just getting a little hectic here. But uh, I'm at least pretty excited. I get to see Hart for the first time, finally, which nice. uh, probably doesn't sound like the Reverend's wheelhouse necessarily, but it very much is. I grew up on all the classic rock shit, and I love it, and uh, I love that band. And th- those ladies are still so fucking talented, and they sound so good. So I'm very excited to see them for the first time. I'm also going to get to see Ario Speedwagon for the first time, so that's kind of cool. Um, not a lot else at that festival that is, like, Peaking my interest. Uh, I mean, I think Salt and Pepper is going to be there. Nice. <laughs> uh, if they do Giddy uh, Up, tape it. <laughs> say it again. If they do Giddy Up, tape it for me. <laughs> <laughs> if I if I make it to their set, I certainly will. Okay. <laughs> uh, I had the opportunity to go see Ace Freely, and I missed out on that. And uh, Tesla, and I missed out on that. So, like, I really am slacking on the concerts this year. I've Usually done five or six big ones by now, but I had, I did see David Allen Coe at the first of the year. I think that's like the only live show that I've been to. So yeah, 2016 is pretty dry for concerts, but I am going to be checking out Heart and Speedwagon. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then of course my schedule is going to pick up big time, uh, in June and July. And of course, uh, but not before it picks up this coming weekend, a week from yesterday, May 28th. Back at the Church of Southern Wrestling in Cornelia, Georgia. Why we wrestle. Going to be there in person for the first time in a while in front of the fans. And I've uh, got some news for the Why We Wrestle champion, Strict Nine. Been doing a lot of research on this bounty. Been reaching out to my underworld connections and trying to find out what's going on and who's behind it. Not having any luck yet, but uh, going to keep pursuing and i'm gonna let him know what i have found out and let him know that there's people there to watch his back since seemingly the entire wrestling world has painted a target on it now, he's one of my original proteges i groomed him from the days of the hate junkies and i'm very proud of the champion that he's become and now he's at a point where he seemed to seemingly has no friends because of the spot that he's in but uh he can count on his rejects because that's a uh, a bond that goes far beyond the wrestling business. So I'm going to be there for him, and I'm going to be uh, equipping the front lines to to help him fight off whoever is behind this bounty. He's going to be there in the main event, taking on Bill the Butcher, this new wild man that's appeared out of nowhere, managed by the Carpenter. Don't know a lot about either of these guys. This Carpenter has laid a wasteland in Platinum Championship Wrestling. He's a very well-spoken, eloquent guy. He's a little quirky. I'm not really sure what his deal is, but he's definitely said that they're there to try to cash in on the bounty. And Strict Nine said, you know what? Fuck it. Uh, If you're going to try to take me out, I at least want to fight you face-to-face. So on May 28th, let's fight in a bounty match. No rules, no DQ, no pinfall. Or I'd rather be pinfall. No uh, no DQ, no count-out. 
just anything goes, and if you want to try to get the bounty, you can do it face-to-face. And so that's what's going to happen on the 28th. That's pretty big right there. Very nice. Okay. Go ahead. No, oh, and there's more. Uh, <laughs> there's there's more. It's a big card. Um, we've got the fastest rising star in the business, in my opinion, young Gunnar Miller, the people's captain, managed mm. by the legendary Jeff G. Bailey, who, you know, Jeff has got this pedigree of talent that he's managed. To think about all the great stars that Jeff G. Bailey has groomed over the years. We're talking about guys like A.J. Styles, R-Truth, Abyss, Gunner from TNA, and so many more. And now Gunner Miller is the next guy. So, you know, if Jeff G. Bailey picks a guy, he's a top prospect. Gunner Miller was a top prospect before Bailey even got a hold of him. But now the sky's the limit. And he's had pretty much no competition in why we wrestled to this point. I mean, he's he's had some, some guys who tried to put up a fight, but Gunner just steamrolled through everybody. And so Bailey... Being Bailey, even though the fans are behind him now, he's certainly not changed his ways. They've just grown to respect him over the years. He's demanding competition. He's saying that uh, the, the competition has been pathetic. Gunner needs to be challenged. He needs to be tested. Well, the man who stepped up to that challenge, you just saw him on Monday Night Raw last week. You see him on NXT just about every other week at least. Corey Hollis will be coming back to the Church of Southern Wrestling to take on Gunnar Miller, and it's a match that's got fans buzzing all across the, the nation right now. So definitely want to be there to check that out. Any thoughts on those two guys? Actually, hell yeah. I've heard a lot about Gunnar Miller and really wish I had a chance to see him live. Now, um, when it comes to Corey, ho oh, oh. Now, I've, I'm going to ask the question, knowing how deep your roots run at the church, and knowing the fact that you've had a number of dealings with Corey over the years, um, the factor, of course, I know um, dealings up at Empire, as well as a number of different promotions, Anarchy. Um, how many can I mention right now? NWA Chattanooga. Um, but from that Ultimate vin- NWA, yeah. NWA main event. <laughs> yeah, really. When you have seen what has happened with Corey um, over the last, I'll give it a year, and then, lo and behold, it's do you do you treat it like a homecoming when he makes his way back to forty two thirty six Level Grove Road? Absolutely, and and he thinks of it as well. Um, you know, he's he's a guy who is very proud to get to that point. Now, you know, his career is on a whole other level. But you know, when he first started wrestling in Cornelia, that was a goal for him, and he's one of those guys that did it the right way. I watched him train from a guy putting up the ring working security, carrying chairs, uh, to, you know, being a complete greenhorn in the ring, but listening like, uh, you know, all these, these guys who want to have a bad attitude and bitch about their spot, um, but they don't listen to anybody. And then you hear a guy like Corey who can go out there and work that modern, fast-paced style as good as anybody, and yet he's always listened. He's always had a good attitude. He's always been a guy that's been a sponge and has been all business. He's not a guy that talks about it. He's a guy that does it. He learned from the Dash Wilders and uh, of the world and the, the Gunner Phil Shatters of the world, you know, that it, you put in the work and you keep your mouth shut and you listen and you learn and you do your own thing, but you find these pieces of advice from various places that helps you mold you into the person that you need to become. You are never going to be the next Shawn Michaels or the next Hulk Hogan or the next Steve Austin or the next John Cena or so forth. You can only to succeed in this business be the first you. Bingo. Corey Hollis has done that, and he's done it in spades, and now it's paying off for him. And so for him to come back and give why we wrestle that match that a lot of promotions are vying for, I think that uh, that speaks a lot to you know whether or not he feels it's a homecoming. Now he has ruffled some feathers with his words, because Corey now is no longer the young man on the block. He's very experienced and world travel gentleman. Matter of fact, him and John Schuyler just won the Resistance Pro Tag Team titles in Chicago. Mm-hmm. They're all over the country right now. Between NXT and their independent bookings, they're everywhere. And, of course, he uh, called out Gunner's lack of experience in a, the promo that we posted there on the Why We Wrestle Twitter page. And uh, he... Uh, 
was in the bathroom with a baby changing station and uh, basically told Gunnar Miller something to the effect that he was going to put a diaper on his ass because in this <laughs> business compared to Corey, he was just a baby. And, of course, Bailey wasn't really particularly thrilled with that and had a rebuttal. And you can follow uh, the Why We Wrestle Twitter over at Why Do You Wrestle on Twitter and you can see that exchange. <laughs> but, um very exciting matchup. I, I think that uh, the fans are excited about it. I think the promotion is excited about it. I think the competitors are excited about it. And uh, Gunnar Miller is going to have his toughest test yet in front of him come Saturday night, I do believe. I do believe that Gunnar Miller is the type of competitor that, as for as young as he is, he can definitely rise to the occasion. Um, I don't think that, especially when you've got the tutelage of Bailey. And look, folks, I'm I'm breaking the wall for a second here. I've said the same thing about Bailey that I say about the good reverend that I say about Al Getz that I say about wicked nemesis that I say about people like father James sinister minister and a number of different managers that I have seen over the years and worked with over the years. When you have a wealth of experience and knowledge that managers of this ilk can give because they have earned and accrued that knowledge You have a pure ace to back up the rest of what could be your royal straight flush in this industry. And Bailey is not going to let Miller go into this totally unprepared. I'm pretty sure that they're watching video on this and trying to um, establish a map of tendencies. You know, that's what a lot of us do in this business is like, okay, right-handed, left-handed, strong side, weak side, which way do you, and which way are they going to go in this regard? Da, 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 da. You put everything together. I'm not saying that's the ultimate strategy, but I'm saying it's part of the strategy. So I'm going to sit back and also say to Corey, it must feel a little bit poetic being able to call somebody else for being the young boy in the business when the same thing was done to you a few years back. Gotta love you, CH. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of your rite of passage, though, isn't it? Like, oh, they do yeah. it to you when you break in, but you get to do it to them. Like, like, you just pass it down. Got done but, to me? Uh, <laughs> oh, go ahead. It was done to me. I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you, man. Uh, so, Jeff, um, you know, he might as well change his name to Coach Bailey lately. Miller's uh, very much a coachable athlete. Uh, he's, of course, uh, NCAA Division II record holder many times over, both on the football field and in the weight room. He lettered in two sports, football and baseball. Um, he was recruited by the WWE prior to him even setting foot in a wrestling ring. They brought it, they flew him down on their dime to NXT to look at him as a prospect and told him to get out on the indies and get some experience. Uh, he was just training with Ace Rockwell at the time. Uh, he has uh, had a mentor relationship with the Ultimate Warrior just before he passed because Gunner wore his face paint as, uh, you know, in the football, the black eye makeup. I don't know what the hell it's called. I'm not a sports guy. But, the eye black. Um, yeah. So he had the eye black on in the shape of the Ultimate Warrior's face paint. The Ultimate Warrior, it caught on some national feed. And uh, the Warrior saw it, and the Warrior contacted him, and they developed a very positive relationship where the Warrior encouraged him regularly as far as his uh, journey into the wrestling business. So, uh, you know, gunner has got a lot behind him, and Jeff's just taking that and molding it. And, of course, Jeff G. Bailey, the agent attorney. A lot of people know about the attorney part, but they forget about the agent part. Uh, he is a sports agent by trade, so he's right at home with Gunner Miller. It couldn't be a better match. Looking forward to it. So that that's a match you just can't miss. And of course, as I mentioned, Strickland and Bill the Butcher in the bounty match. I, I did already send Brad Cash two weeks ago, who's my latest protege, uh, to help out Strict Nine, and I, I'm sure he's going to be in tow on the 28th as well. But what else we got going on? Well, the in the uh, the Why We Wrestle Tag Team Championship Tournament still going on. Tag teams from all over the country have come in to try to compete for this prestigious prize. And um, oh, go ahead. I didn't say anything. Oh, I, I, I God, I could have swore that I'm hearing things now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the tag team tournament, we've got uh, tag teams from all over. Tag teams that have advanced so far would be teams like the Hooligans, uh, the FIP tag team champions currently, as well as many, many other prestigious city promotions. Uh, the Dark City Fight Club, former NWA World Tag Team Champions, have advanced. The team of Billy Buck and James Drake. 
have advanced. Unlikely duo, but Billy Buck's a huge, huge star in the, the arena there at the church. Very beloved by the fans for all the efforts he's put in over the years. And James Drake's a newcomer to the building. He's had some success over in PWX, which is a very prestigious promotion. And uh, now he's come in with Billy Buck. And they're two guys. Um, they remind me very much of a Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch type combination. They don't have the six-pack abs. They're not uh, high flyers necessarily. But, man, they get in there and get it done. The people respond to it. So they're they're probably the most popular tag team in the tournament. Um, and coming up this week... On the 28th, we've got a few that we've got a, with the debut of the Lynch Mob, who have really started to blow up and make a buzz of themselves. Uh, Empire Wrestling Originals. And now it's a brother tandem of Matt and Joey Lynch. And uh, great high flyers, but they've got that unique chemistry, that brother chemistry that, that you've been a tag team, not since you got in the wrestling business, but from the day you were born. And so they have that unique advantage, and they're. Uh, really looking forward to coming in. They're going to be taking on Anthony Henry and a partner of his choosing. Originally, it was scheduled to be Aaron Epic, but Anthony has advised us that Epic may have had a scheduling conflict where he says he's got a partner. Says it doesn't matter who he picks as his partner, he's going to win the tournament because he's the greatest athlete in why we wrestle. So that's going to be a hell of a matchup. We also have the sound and the fury. Will Huckabee and Joe Black, the former oh. NWA and Tag Team champions, coming back. Oh. And they're going to be against the team that has yet to be announced for their entry into the tournament. They've got a surprise team that's going to be making their debut on the 28th in the tournament. They're going to be taking on the Sound and the Fury. And we've got a whole lot more tournament action coming up in the next few weeks, so stay tuned to that. Uh, We'll also have Nemesis, the most controversial man in Why We Wrestle, returning from his 30-day suspension, and he will be in the ring taking on a hell of a competitor from from the uh, the Midwest, Gary J, will be making his debut at Why We Wrestle, and uh, so that that's a unique matchup. Nemesis fresh off suspension, and uh, this newcomer coming in here, he's got a great reputation, but I don't know if he's ever faced anything like this guy. He's just got no regard for anybody. Um, and of course, we saw Nemesis and Jacob Ashworth on the talent show. Uh, and when the Nemesis was suspended, he tried to pull a, a Scooby-Doo move almost, and he was dressed up like a cameraman in disguise, and he just let Jacob know he could get him anywhere he wanted him. And so that feud rages on. Jacob Ashworth, not on the card, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's there. Uh, he had some very strong words for Nemesis last time, and this is far from over, so just keep your eyes peeled to that. Uh, we also got Kevin Blue, who was victorious in the main event against Jacob Ashworth, using the camera that Nemesis left at ringside as a foreign object to take out Ashworth and get the win. And he's going to be taking on newcomer Troy Hunt, who's had a, a spotty one loss record, but he's had a little momentum. He's got two or three wins in a row stacked up now. Uh, the people seem to be responding to him, but Kevin Blue. He was the the former Triple Crown champion prior to the tournament. He's uh, one of the top guys in Why We Wrestle and has staked that reputation. So that's going to be an interesting matchup of a guy who needs really badly to get his momentum back up to go back after the title and a guy who needs to get his momentum up, period, to make a mark in the company. Do me a favor. Let me jump in for a second because you mentioned a tag team that I'm a huge fan of, and that would be Huckabee and Black Sound and Fury. I've worked with these guys on a couple of different occasions in another promotion, and I will sit back and tell this one very clearly. Folks, if you've never seen Huckabee and Black live and in, uh, in person, be ready for this because they are genuinely one of the hardest hitting tag teams you will ever come across they come into the ring with an attitude it doesn't matter what corner or locker room they're fighting out of these guys have their heart and their soul not to mention their anger leading the way and they oh yeah i mean they are just they're an absolute fun to watch um i'm gonna go ahead and pull back a curtain a little bit i've watched these guys take on a in other promotions a tag team called team iou iggy and awful um, and these t- that those two teams have had absolutely electric matchups all around the Southeast. So whatever team is making their debut on the 28th to take on the Sound and the Fury, I will sit back and say this, and I'm not being condescending, and I'm not being an ass when I say this, bring your damn A game because Sound and Fury, Huckabee and Black are going to bring theirs. Oh, they're going to have to. they got something to prove coming into this. They haven't really been back in the building on a regular basis. 
since uh, the, the anarchy days. Um, they, they've been sort of guest stars at while we wrestle, but I think they really want to make their mark. They've gone out across the country, and they've done a lot of things, and they're just a ferocious tag team. I can speak to that firsthand. The last time I made an appearance prior to Hardcore Hell, the last anarchy appearance I made, was managing the tag team of Strict Nine and Azrael as they defeated the Sound and the Fury for the Anarchy Tag Team titles, and those guys brought it. Um, so they, they've got a chip on their shoulder, and I wouldn't want to be in their way, and I wouldn't want to be that tag team that's fighting them. So they're going to be there. You better show up, too. Oh, hell yeah. Now, also, you bring up Nemesis versus Gary J, right? Yes. Funny, in the words of Alan, in the words of Jimmy Buffett to Alan Jackson in the song Five O'Clock Somewhere, it's funny you should say that, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Gary J, actually our guest this evening um, on Sunday, May 22nd, um, on Beyond Ringside Live, having had an opportunity to get to know um, Gary J a lot better in um, a lot of in ring, out of ring, on the road, and behind the scenes things um, that have all contributed to Gary J's journey in pro wrestling this far. And he actually brought up the 28th and nemesis. We didn't go into too much detail on it, but um, he is definitely looking forward to the challenge on the 28th in Cornelia. Yeah. It's, it's he, he's going to be facing something that, uh, you know, he's got a lot of wrestling skills. Nemesis is probably surprised some people with his wrestling skills, but he's crazy like a Fox. I, I mean, you can never underestimate him. He'll stoop to no lengths to win a match. Uh, you, you know, it's just, there, there's no length he wouldn't stoop to, should I say, to win a match. And so that's going to be an interesting fight in and of itself. Once we got some big announcements coming up as far as naming a number one contender to strict nine, because of all this bounty situation, we really haven't had a chance to focus on the championship ranking. So you're going to get to see some sort of official announcement about the crowning, of an official number one contender as Why We Wrestle goes into their summer spectacular on July 30th, Summer of Hate. That's going to be the big shebang for the summer, but second and fourth Saturdays Why We Wrestle will be there at the Church of Southern Wrestling, the famed home formerly of NWA Anarchy and NWA Wildside, one of the last historic wrestling venues in the country still standing. There is no more Omni, there is no more Sportatorium, but there still is the church, and you can come there the second and fourth Saturdays and be a part of history because we've already seen the future superstars of this generation come through there, and even the last generation now. And now I look forward to many more future generations of superstars coming through that building. Like I said, Corey Hollis, who will be returning, uh, one of those who's now achieving that success that we, we set out to. You know, it's just the, the why we wrestle system. I, it, we're trying to go back to the, the old wild side system of just developing talent and um, trying to get guys ready for the next level. We've reinstated a bunch of the brain trust from the previous eras uh, in the back and working with talent and just, you know, just trying to keep that same thing going. Uh, we've got a big seminar with Les Thatcher and George South coming down for the guys uh, on July 30th as well. If you want to sign up for that, it's $50. Uh, hit up this is why we wrestle at gmail.com if you want to reserve your spot. Cannot understate or cannot overstate the value of that camp. I'm with you. you. Really, Go ahead. Are you really just the guys that want to take their game to the next level? You know, I saw Andrew Alexander, our co-host. We'll, we'll throw him under the bus for a minute. There you go. Good reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was a very good wrestler for many years. He was a respected independent wrestler. He was a locker room leader. He was a guy that younger guys went to to either watch their match or give them critique or help them. He was considered a guy that knew what he was talking about. He did the Les Thatcher camp. He went from a very good worker to a great professional wrestler. Like, well, it's just, it, it will open your eyes at a level that you cannot imagine. So if you're talent in the business, clear your calendar. And July 30th, come on down to Summer of Hate, check out the event, and partake in the Les Thatcher and George South training seminar. Do me a favor. And I'm, I'm going to throw my two cents worth in on this one also, because with all the people that I speak to, with all the people with whom I work, everybody always wants to talk about taking their game to the next level. There's two things that you do, actually three, that will help you take it to that next tier, that next level. Number one, of course, 
pay attention. Number two, never stop the training. When you think you've learned everything there is to learn about professional wrestling, get the hell out of my business. And that's what every vet will tell you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Most people over six months will tell you the same damn thing, too. Um, yeah, really. Like, they actually say that at six months into the business. Horse crap. They still think, I'm going to be the I'm gonna be the next Hulk Hogan. Now, be the first you first, you prick. <laughs> the number three thing is take advantage of every opportunity that is presented to you. When you have an opportunity, like July 30th, to sit under the learning tree, if you will. And if you want to use that as a biblical reference, fine, great, wonderful. If you want to use it as a historic reference, great, fine, wonderful. Use it as a reality reference. Because when you've got an individual who's been there, done that, actually two individuals been there, done that, on many levels in the world of professional wrestling, or dare I use that word, the business drink of professional wrestling. I'll explain that later. The fact of the matter is, you take those opportunities. If you're not, okay, I can understand if you have a family obligation. I can understand if you have to W-O-R-K at another J-O-B. But if you have that time and you keep wanting to shoot your mouth off about how good you are and how great you're going to be, and you don't take advantage of an opportunity like that when you have that chance, first off, you're an idiot. Second off, you're showing everybody how serious you are about being the absolute best in the industry. Thatcher, world-renowned. George South, Mr. Number One. George South, well-renowned. Both. A great fountain of information, knowledge, and technique improvement. It will help, period. It will help you improve and help you get better and closer to being that superstar that you want to be because you're going to learn a little bit more about efficiency and technique. Trust me on that one. Dan? Oh, I agree. I, I remember one time me and Bill Barron's kind of had a tip when I brought Les in for the first camp when I was a booker back in Anarchy. And uh, not it was a test, really. But Bill was just like, well, but you know, I respect Les and everything, but he's not affiliated with the major office, and we're trying to get people jobs here. I'm like, well, that's not what this is about, you know. It's like this is this is about just do you want to get better at what you do? Then you know, soaking all the knowledge you can. Not that it's going to get you a job necessarily, but you know, you can't hurt yourself by attaining additional skills uh, and. So there's guys like, and I think a a lot of the younger generation that that seems to be so vocal about criticism doesn't quite understand where it's coming from. And yeah, I mean, if it's some guy's never done anything and is just shitting on you to shit on you to get themselves over and to feel good about themselves or feel big and bad, then fuck those guys. I mean, you know, they're, they're not here for the good of the business, but you know, when somebody has been around and legitimately gives you advice, they're not trying to tear you down. They're trying to fucking help you. So, you know, listen, I I think that so many uh, of the the younger class, should we say the freshman class, if you will, uh, they, they, they take criticism as some kind of insult. It's not an insult. You know, the wrestling styles evolved. It is a faster paced style than it ever was now, but that doesn't mean it can't still make sense. Watch AJ Styles. He was an inventor of that style. Everything he fucking does makes sense. Yeah. As shown by the main event of fucking WWE that he was in tonight. Yep. Um, Let me also throw this one out, kids. Uh, We have bestowed the virtues of Corey Hollis a few minutes ago here on this broadcast. And I'm going to yank that little curtain back one more quick time. If you think for a second that Corey Hollis made it to Ring of Honor without attending seminars, i.e. Brutal Bob's Evans seminars and ROH sanctioned seminars, uh, think again, because people like him, Leo Rush, and a number of the other people in the top prospect tournaments that have been respectively in the last couple of years, those are the people who took the time to go to seminars, whether they were Thatcher or South, whether they were Rock and Roll Express, whether they were... um, I, 
how many different people are holding seminars, but see, think about it is how many people. I mean, everybody is. And and let me be clear. Like there's some guys you're, you you can tell, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, but certain names you can see (laughs) on the marquee and be like, okay, well, I don't know what I'm really going to take away from this. Not to say that, that even those guys don't have something to offer, but it, you know, is it worth paying money for a seminar when you could probably pick their brain in the locker room and get about the same information? Probably not. But guys who are well renowned for doing this, your Thatchers, your Al Snows, you know, guys who, who sort of travel the circuit and do these seminars, you know, Snow was the one I was trying to think of. Snow was the one I was trying to think of. He's another one who's been all around the world. He's worked national television with three different companies. I mean, and you get a chance to go uh, get in the ring and work with him, sit under the learning tree. Damn right. Same thing. With, like I said, one more time real quick. If you have that opportunity and you can make it to Cornelia, to the church on that date in July, when South is going to be there and when Thatcher's going to be there, do it. Yeah, you, you got got to, got to, got to, got to. It's, uh, and you know, if you're, you're planning on increasing your career. Now, if you're admittedly on the downhill slope, maybe you don't want to do it. But, you know, you also got to probably reconsider how much longer you want to do this. Um, that's just my two cents, especially if you're a wrestler. I mean, you know, managers, announcers, other that you can benefit from it as well. Yeah. But particularly, this these seminars are geared towards the wrestlers. You know, I've seen lessons. And then he can certainly teach you no matter what spot you do. But if you're a wrestler, that's where you're going to benefit the most from it. So that's that. The, uh, quickly plug the Why We Wrestle social media. Yeah, again, Twitter is Why Do You Wrestle. Facebook and Instagram is This Is Why We Wrestle. And you can email them at This Is Why We Wrestle at gmail.com. Uh, sort of a new uh, brain trust in there trying to help out the promotion and uh, trying to, to move things forward. We know they got off to a little bit of a rocky start, and that's okay. Anarchy got off to a bit of a rocky start, and so did Wildside. So, you know, it's not, uh, this is a company that's forging its identity, and that's that's sort of what some of the old guard is trying to, to help do because there was a, a unique identity with Wildside. It was separate. With Anarchy had its own unique identity that was completely different from that of Wildside. And so why we wrestle, it's important for them to create their own identity that acknowledges all of that history, but it's something in and of itself as well. So that's, that's what we're looking for there. And then, um, I'm going to be all over the place. I mean, platinum championship wrestling in July, uh, July the 9th, I believe. And then also be back there in September. And uh, I'll probably be there a little more as well. It's still working out some of the extra dates, but at least two confirmed there, August the 20th, I will be in Knoxville, Tennessee, Managing the newer version of the Devil's Rejects, the Strong Style Psycho Tank, and Death Wish Brad Cash hmm. against a young man named Christian Lotus and his tag team partner, the ECW legend, the innovator of violence, Tommy Dreamer. So we're looking forward to covering up the orange and white with blood red. Uh, Tommy Dreamer certainly is a, a legend of legends when it comes to hardcore wrestling in particular, but he's just a generally well-loved and respected figure in the industry. And uh, we look forward to locking horns with him, but that's not going to mean anything come August the 20th to the rejects because they're out for blood and tank and Brad Cash know exactly what it's going to do for their career to put Tommy dreamer on his ass. So you can better believe that's what's going to happen on August the 20th in Knoxville, Tennessee, for Perfect Pat's Knoxville War Zone Southeastern Championship Wrestling. That's a mouthful. But uh, it's a benefit for the Knoxville Sheriff's Department. It'll be at the Knoxville Boys and Girls Club. Eddie, did I lose you? No, I'm right here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Dude, you were, you were in promo mode. I was staying out of your way. <laughs> oh, you're fine. You're fine. I... <laughs> I just had to get that one out of the way because that's a big one. And then uh, Dragon Con, I will be returning to Dragon Con Championship Wrestling this year. Still awaiting the official night announcement. Um, Of course, traditionally, one of the most popular events at this sci-fi con that draws tens of thousands of people each year. Uh, The wrestling itself puts about 2,000 people in the event hall each time. And so for some reason, I'm hearing a nasty rumor that it might be moving to Thursday night this Mm -hmm. year, which is, um, there's really nothing going on at Dragon Con on Thursday night. So I don't know, maybe they're trying to make it 
something that's happening by moving it. I not this is not confirmed. This is just the rumor mill. So I'm not trying to to spread falsehoods. I'm just letting you people know what I've heard, and I'll let you know just as soon as it's all confirmed. But I'm I'm definitely fine to be there. It's just a matter of what we're going to hear about the official announcement on the wrestling and when that's going to occur. And then, of course, August 5th and 6th in Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Scenic City Invitational. I'll be taking a break from my devilish activities to put the announcer's booth uh, back into play and hop back in there and join my broadcast colleague, Al Getz, as we return for another edition of the Scenic City Invitational. The 2016 field is looking tremendous. Lots of great talent from all over. Follow them on Twitter at SCI Tournament. What are you thinking about the Scenic City Invitational announcements? So I'm still trying to take everything in because I was actually, I'll tell you the truth, I was doing a little bit of research on Dragon Con as far as the dates go. Um, and I'm looking to see exactly where that's going to fall because I would like to, I would like to finally make it there. I have so many people. Okay. On some of these events that you're doing, first off, I'm jealous, you ass. Um, <laughs> Cause there are times, you know, for as much as I love road trips and for me, Atlanta's two and a half hour. Uh, okay. I'm lying an hour 45. I drive like a madman. And if anybody listens right now from the Georgia State Patrol or Alabama State Troopers, I'm kidding. <laughs> How you doing? Good to see you. Allegedly. You allegedly drive like a madman. <laughs> Here's our favorite word on the damn station, allegedly. <laughs> yeah. And I've had opportunity after opportunity and door after door open for me to go to Dragon Con. And lo and behold, it's kind of like last minute. It's like I get a date change or I get a booking dropped in my lap. It's like, son of a bitch. And I'm looking to see where everything's going to be. And this year, it is September th- um, 2nd through September 5th. That is going to be the 30th annual Dragon Con. They are working on, um, like I said, I'm monitoring right now. DragonCon.org is bookmarked on my stuff. And I'm looking to see if um, see what's going to fall where as far as... Um, what's going to what the numbers are as far as going because i know this whole damn thing sells out and if you don't get tickets um, you can you can if you do you can get a day pass what what sells out typically are the weekend passes in advance right. and they release some more so it's like i've never had the only time i've seen people in the issue of the sell is you get there on like saturday and try to buy your tickets and you're right. probably fucked but you know you get there friday morning when really everything starts kicking off then you can get in registration and get your badge uh we've had to do that several years for my wife because you know we're big nerds too we like to do the cons that's typically we take a couple of road trips a year to go to different cons we've been up to heroes con in charlotte the last couple of years and uh, just you know try to check out different things and uh so dragon con's always been a a big event for us because we dress up and do our cosplay and go out and party with people and um, after the show, you know, it's just like a bonus. You get to go there and work and get paid, and then you get to go out and have a good time. And, uh, you know, in previous years, we've had to buy a pass for her, uh, and recently my Hall of Fame privileges have finally started helping me out where I don't have to do that. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, yeah, if you, as long as you get in there on Friday, you'll be good. Now, you were also asking about the Scenic City Invitational. This is another one that I would love to be able to attend in person. I, I've always heard, okay, from the time that I first found out about it to the time, like right now, it's like, is this really right around the corner? And yet, once again, <laughs> it is. And you are going to have stars like Gunnar Miller, Corey Hollis, Kyle Matthews, um, Ray Fury already confirmed to be there. John Schuyler slated to be there. If my notes are correct, Jimmy Rave is already um, slated to be, um, scheduled to appear at this event, which is going to be Friday, August 5th, Saturday, August 6th, if my notes are correct, right? That is correct. Jimmy Rave, the returning champion of the Scenic City Invitational, will be back to defend his title in, in a way because, of course, it's not a, a championship that you can lose in a match necessarily, but being the returning champion of the tournament and whoever's paired up against him is going to be looking to defeat him and unseat him. So that's going to be exciting. Uh, Leo Rush has also been named as a participant. I think that was the only one that you missed of the ones that had been announced so far. So they, they've got a really exciting card, and I'm really just honored to be a part of that, of course. Uh, and it was really, really blown away by the reaction that we got last year from the commentary and just all of the kind words, the wrestling fans from all over the globe had to say 
I got comments from fans in Australia, Ireland, the UK. Uh, it was just mind blowing how far the reach was on that Phoenix City Invitational. So we're looking forward to knocking it out for part two of that here in 2016. And again, you can follow them on Twitter at SCI Tournament. So don't miss that. So you see, my plate's pretty full, but one more thing I have to plug before we get out of here. The Somehow We Manage podcast, my new podcast with Al Getz, my Phoenix City Invitational broadcast colleague, as we have gone on a mission. And Eddie, that mission is to dissect the history and the art form of professional wrestling managing. <laughs> so we started back going all the way back to the beginning of the first episode. We looked at men like Bobby Davis and Ed the Strangler Lewis and Wild Red Berry, who were the prototypical original wrestling managers as far as we could find records of they were the original three and then we started going into different eras and having various topical discussions on those that led into special guests a few weeks ago we had pat rose on and what was pat's significance to being a wrestling manager none himself other than he did it one time but he was also managed by the late sensational sherry martell for right. a run in memphis so we got to spend an hour talking to pat about sherry and her life and his experiences with her that was a wonderful episode, and this week just went up this past Thursday. We sat down for two hours with the manager of the Four Horsemen, a man in three Hall of Fames, one of the all-time greats in the history of the business, no matter where you go or what territory you were in. James J. Dillon of the Four Horsemen was on somehow we managed this week. It's a great episode, two hours, and he goes balls to the wall into the spot of what it means to be a wrestling manager. So you got to check that out. That's over at wrestlingwithwords.com. And that is a great wrestling website. They've got all kinds of news articles, editorials. Uh, they're really expanding and becoming one of the premier wrestling websites right now to cover a variety of topics. They cover all the independence, mainstream wrestling. There's a whole podcast network there. You really need to do yourself a favor if you're a wrestling fan and check out wrestlingwithwords.com, the home of somehow we manage and a host of other great podcasts and services. I need to ask a question. I have the information for it on um, SCI and the event is going to be held at East Hamilton high school. Give me the pronunciation of the road. Ultawa. <laughs> well, Ultawa, I'm sure is the correct pronunciation, but you forget we're in the Southeast. Eddie, okay. so that's not exactly how things are pronounced, according at least to phonetics. Uh, it's Ottawa, um, I believe is how they pronounce it. Ottawa, I believe, is, okay. is the correct pronunciation. <laughs> um, like, uh, you know, most places you go, like Louisiana and in, in, in Illinois, or Indiana, rather, you have a city called Lafayette. And it's like Lafayette. Clearly, that's what that says. That's a French word. We have a town also called that here in North Georgia, just south of Chattanooga, and it's not called fucking Lafayette. They call it Lafayette. Yeah, I know. For some fucking reason. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Priceless. Still priceless. <laughs> Udawa, Ultawa, tomato, tomato, whatever you want to call it. Type it into your GPS. It'll get you there. Exactly. And like I said, that's going to be one. Now, I was on their little, I was on their page and I was looking at the announcements that, already, that they had already made. So I think you actually got a scoop on part of their social media network due to the fact that they had not made the public announcement about Leo Rush yet. I mean, but that's all, that's, that's another damn good entrant in there. Oh, no, yeah, they, they, they publicly announced it. I, okay. I have no inside track on the entries. I, I specifically asked to not be kept in the loop on that until time comes. I'll be handling commentary. I'll also be working in the locker room, handling some agenting and other duties there, uh, some, some production type things on that event. So it's going to be a, a fun night. But no, I, I have no inside track on the entries or anything else. Um, that's, uh, I specifically asked to be kept in the dark. That's all from official things that they put out. You know, and you bring up uh, the um, somehow we manage where you had an opportunity to speak about. Um, you spoke with uh, Pat about Sherry, and that's an individual who I've had a number of great dealings with over the years. She is I've worked with her on a number of different um, promotions um, in all around the southeastern U.S. at various points, and I will just sit back and say that Sherry Martell, first off, is still severely missed in my world. Um, was always very kind, very cordial. Um, we had great conversation and just hung out, cut up. And 
I we had what I would consider to be a great functional friendship as well as a great working relationship. And when she left, that put a huge hole. And like I said, I said the same. I said it a minute ago. I'll say it all over again. So uh, people like Sherry in my world, um, the chasm doesn't get filled and they will forever be missed. And when we lost her, we lost not only somebody who is a true Hall of Famer, but also probably one of the most genuine in a lot of ways individuals in pro wrestling. Yeah, I, I've heard only nothing but that, and I, I really regret that I never got to meet Sherry or talk to her. She was a big influence on me as a manager, and um, you know, I, this, like actually, our paths so often almost crossed. It was just seemed like she would be working a place right as I was leaving, or vice versa. So we never really like we never really got to, to hang out and work together. Like, like for example, she was a pretty regular appearer on Dragon Con for several years and then by the time i started doing it she had gone on and not you know doing other things at that point right so it, you know this is a damn shame that we never got to hook up and i never got to sit under that learning tree for a little bit but uh yeah it, echo everything you said she, she'll be severely missed and so you check out that show if you want to get uh some, some more insight into the life of sherry because you knew her personally you know it's probably insights you already have but the listeners can certainly enjoy that and Eddie, oh, yeah. i think that's gonna wrap it up for the evening we're here uh we breeze through this in no time so you were quite a an outstanding <laughs> guest host now i'm going to pit you and andrew against each other and you'll have a trial by combat to see who is the new guest host <laughs> well do me a favor before you before you throw that one let me go and throw a shameless shill out real, real quick um you've heard the reference for our friends over in the great state of georgia as well as um, southeastern Tennessee, South Carolina. Definitely check it out this coming Saturday night, 4236 Level Grove Road. Um, why We Wrestle Back in Action. Bounty Hunter is going to be a great card for our friends in Central Georgia, Western Georgia, all through the great state of Alabama, Northwestern Florida. I would like to invite you to come say hi over at Global Championship Wrestling this coming Saturday night in Pell City, Alabama. I will be back behind the microphone for GCW. Um, Global Warfare 6. Global Warfare 2016 kicks off 7.30 p.m. in the Central Time Zone. And from that vantage point, tickets are only $10 each. Doors are going to open at 7 o'clock in the main event, Steel Cage Elimination for the GCW World Tag Team Championships. The champs, Mad Justice, Mad Dog Dan Sawyer, and Leon the Bull Stresser defend against the Brotherhood. O'Hagan, the middleweight champion, and his tag team partner, Maniac O'Malley. And God only knows who all is going to be around ringside, but guess what? There will be a steel cage erected around the ring, so there will not be outside interference. However, be sure to tune in this coming Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, right here on Beyond Ringside Sports Radio and ProWrestlingRadio.net. Global Championship Wrestling's GCW Radio, yours truly, along with Dan Sawyer. We will have all of the late-breaking information Asterisk, subject to change without notice. Well, guess what? We're going to give you that asterisk and a little notice this coming Tuesday night on GCW Radio. Rev? Awesome. Well, the only thing I'll add is you can follow me on Twitter at Dragons Rejects, on Instagram at Dragons Rejects, on Facebook at Rev Dan the Dragon Wilson, and I'll try to keep you updated on where I'm at as my schedule gets increasingly more insane for the summertime, especially for me, because I'm a guy who's like, I, I said years ago, I'm kind of semi-retired. Not that I'm like trying to quit or anything. I'm just like, I'm, you know, I'm older than the big leagues probably want to give a job. So it's like, I've, I've never stopped trying to reach that goal and be the best I can be. But, you know, I got a family now. I want to take it a little easy. And of course, semi-retired for me is only taking five or six bookings a month. <laughs> it looks like so. Yeah. Uh, going to be a fun summer though. And I, Look forward to you joining the ride with me. And as always, keep one foot in the gutter and one fist in the gold and two horns in the air. Hell yeah. Good night.